Amen. Well, have you ever met that guy, that gal that seems to be stuck living in the past? They, they're stuck living in the past, the good old days, the glory days. Uh, you know that guy, he's always talking about his high school football escapades. Huh? Don't nudge your husband right now. I know you were about to. Friday night comes, they whip out that highlight video. Let's go, kids. Let's get the popcorn. Show you what a stud dad was. The good old days. Or the mom, you know, breaks out the prom queen picture. Hey, hey. Good old days. I think a lot of us do that. I, I find myself, full disclosure, pastor confession, sometimes, man, I'm living in the glory days. Uh, on the mission trip, I got a chance to teach a nine-year-old the NFL route tree. And I thought I was Joe Montana, just throwing dimes. <laughs> this nine-year-old, like, in the NFL route tree, I literally taught him, it's, it's a number system, you know, zero through nine. And this nine-year-old in 30 minutes perfected the NFL route tree. And I, I felt real good, three-step drop, just zinging it in there. I mean, homie was pluck tuck. He was getting north and south. I'm like, yo, I know Brock went down. You need to call me in real quick and see, see what happens. Anybody? Can you, can you relate? Because sometimes, if we're honest, the old days are much better than our current reality. And I believe there, there's a lot of people that are stuck in the past because their current reality is just too hard to deal with. You know, it's one thing if it's high school football or, you know, glory days of the past and what used to be with the good things. But, but what about when life was going great and then all of a sudden out of nowhere, there was a tragic death of a loved one and you can't seem to move forward. Or, or moving forward in life and everything was going great and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the spouse that you were married to for 20 years just bounced, loses their mind and just bounces. And now you have this chaotic divorce. What if you're Johnny Erickson Tata and at age 17 have a tragic diving accident and overnight become a paraplegic and cannot move anything? 17 years old. What do you do then? What, what, you're, what do you just stay stuck and angry at God? And how could this happen? I can't believe it. My life is over. Do you stay stuck? Just this past Sunday, man, I felt, you know, and because it could be crazy, tragic like that. It could be other things. This, this guy I absolutely love, this quarterback that took over for the 49ers, he, who invested in one of our boys, just an awesome, humble guy. He wins, like he's Mr. Irrelevant. He gets drafted the very last person in the NFL draft, and, and he gets thrown in the mix and, and reels off seven games in a row, seven wins in a row, takes his team to the NFC championship, and then one play, this tight end tries to make a block and super athletic guy gets around him and this is his hand and in one play tears his elbow completely apart. Done. Ah! And I just think that there's, you know, and, and put yourself in the situation or where you're at right now. I mean, there's so many different things that if we're really honest, we get so upset, we get stuck in, and we try to just relive the past. It's like we're in this, in our minds, we're still there, but the reality is real life is moving forward, and if we don't do something about it, we stay stuck maybe for the rest of our life. The picture I got in my mind was like, uh, and this is your homework, <laughs> make sure it's not a lot of cars around, but, but today, what I want you to do when you're driving your car, drive with looking through the rearview mirror. Now, I just said, make sure that maybe there's not a whole lot of people around. But, but here's the thing. What's going to happen? Eventually, you're going to lose it. And you're going to hurt people around you. And the life is not going to move forward. 
It's going to be tragic. Well, why do I bring all this? Well, this is Job, and it makes sense. In Job chapter 29, you're going to see that Job is reminiscent about the good old days. When, when life used to be, remember Job? Remember the story? You guys been reading Job, the richest dude in the East. Dude was a baller, shot caller. Guy just ran the place. And in one day, loses all of his possessions. He loses his family, loses his health. <laughs> in this interesting cosmic deal that God and Satan are making, it just blows my mind. You remember what, what Satan said about Job? The only reason Job really likes you, God, is because you've blessed him. But if you allow me to take it away, he's going to curse you to your face. And God says, okay, which I still am like, poor Job. And you see Job for chapters and, you know, his, his homies come and they're, they're thinking you got some secret sin. And for chapters, we've been reading back and forth, the, fr the friends come clean, Job, you got something going on. And then he gets to 29. I don't want you to take a look at it and. If you're a note taker, he's reminiscing about, number one, the past provision in his life. Let's check it out. Job 29, verse 2. Look what he says right here. That's <laughs> so wild. I long, what does it say? For the years gone by, the good old days, when, watch this, tune in, when God took care of me, when he lit up the way before me and I walked safely through darkness, when I was in my prime, God's friendship was felt in my home. The Almighty was still with me, and my children were around me. Nothing better. My cows produced milk in abundance, and my groves poured out streams of olive oil. There's another version in verse six that says, watch this, my steps were awash in cream, and the rocks gushed olive oil for me. In other words, life was butter. Everybody say butter. No, not butter, butter. That's what his life was. A lot of times people will ask me, Todd, how, how you doing? And how many, how many know my response? I'm living the dream. And I mean that. And that's Job. Job, he's, he's remembering back to when life was butter and God's provision, his cows produced, his oil. I mean, it's just this idea of just beautiful poetry of his life was flowing. It was like the, the faucet of the father's favor was flowing into his life. And he's remembering back to the abundance. Do you notice it? And he's talking about God's presence. I think that was the one of the things that he really was remembering the most was God's presence. He was with me. And now I just feel him completely gone. One of the things that was cool, I was studying this and I was thinking, what did Job do with that abundance? And do you know for, for chapters, he never defended himself on how good he was and what all he did for God. But I want you to, I want you to see this in Job 29, verse 13, or 12, excuse me, he, he finally breaks down and he, he talks about, it. he said, I assisted the poor in their need and the orphans who required help. I helped those without hope. Oh my goodness, that's good. And they blessed me and I caused the widow's hearts to sing for joy. He remembers the provision, but he also remembers what he did with that provision. And let me just submit to all of us real quick. If you've been blessed financially or different gifts, man, use them, steward those gifts. We, we had the privilege recently to meet the CEO of Convoy of Hope, one of our partners that we're going to begin to support. Anybody familiar with Convoy of Hope? Just raise your hand. If, just go Google Convoy of Hope. And this CEO told his story about <laughs> what God called him to. And now, over the last, I think since 1994, they have given close to $1 billion of aid and helped, what is it, 70 million people since 1994. Necessities, needs, the poor, the widow, 
People right now in the Ukraine, they have, they have all kinds of aid going. And what happens is we as a church get a partner with a bunch of other churches where all a ton of resource flows through us, through Convoy of Hope, and actually gets to action and helps people. It's so cool. And, and this is what Job is talking about. Living a life, this prosperous life, and, and we are just a conduit of blessing. We call it at this church, love out loud. You know, you, you can talk about love, but when it's flowing through you, man, everybody throw up the L real quick. That, that's the whole idea. It's loving God supremely. And then his, his love, his grace, his power, his presence, his provision is flowing through you. And all of a sudden someone's like, now, why'd you do that? Hey man, God bless you. And it's wild because the the people outside the church, they, they think we're just coming to beat them with a Bible and all of a sudden you bring a blessing, something changes. And, and we're living out what true Christianity is. It's wild. We were um, in Guatemala and we visited, we were on this food outreach and so we brought a bunch of food to one of the poorest areas in Guatemala in that area where there's no running water, no electricity. We went to this little hut and it was a tiny little hut with 13 people living in it. They had a wood burning stove, so it was all smoky, tons of fleas, flies everywhere. And, and it was wild because as we're like praying and Denise is sharing the gospel, leading people to Christ in this little hut, this 12 year old dude flies through the, the little window. It wasn't a window, it was like an opening. He like flies through onto this queen bed. His name was Nelson. And the dude had the biggest smile on his face. And I'm like, dude. And we brought all we, one of the things we brought was a used soccer ball. And we gave it to Nelson. You thought Nelson won the lottery. And we're outside and I'm, I'm a football guy. I'm trying to kick, I need a J there. I was trying to do my, you know, do the whole deal. <laughs> There's just something though about, and, and that's, that's, I, that's the picture of Job I get. Job is just on mission to bless people out of the abundance of the resource. And he's living in the past though. He's thinking, oh man, I wish we could just go back to that time. Some of you in here, I wish I could go back to the time before the stock market went crazy this year. or <laughs> Before, you know, when, when my house was in order and now I'm on the streets, whatever it is, like there's, there's something that we're living in the past, not just provision, uh, past position. Look at verse seven, Job 29, verse seven. <laughs> I don't know if you read the Bible like I do, but I was reading this and I, I underlined this first phrase. Look at verse, verse seven. Those were the days. Everybody say, those were the days. Uh -huh. You remember those days? Those were the days when I went to the city gate and took my place among the honored leaders. The young stepped aside when they saw me. Even the aged rose in respect at my coming. The princes stood in silence and put their hands over their mouths. The highest officials of the city stood quietly, holding their tongues in respect. All who heard me praised me and all who saw me, what did they do? They spoke well of me. He remembers the good old days. He was a community leader. Ton of respect. He'd walk by and people would be like, oh man, there's Job. There he is. He's the guy. They spoke well of him. He held this community position. And when the, with the position came privilege and honor and respect. And he's thinking back to that point. Because remember right now, you know what's really happening right now? People are mocking him. His own friends are assuming and, and casting judgment on him. Then this dude, Elihu, shows up and calls and talks trash again. And people now that were praising him are now talking trash. And he's thinking about the good old days. You ever lost a, a real solid position maybe at your workplace and they downsized you and you used to have this respect? I remember um, <laughs> speaking of the good old days, in the NFL, when you make it to the NFL, you know when you really made it, they actually give you an NFL card. This is a true story. 
It's this white little card. Any NFL people here, you know what I'm talking about. You get to, and it just says your name on it. It's like a little credit card that says NFL. And I'm like, they sent it to me in the mail. I was like, I've arrived. <laughs> but it was short-lived. That's why the NFL, it's, it stands for not for long. And it's interesting because, you know, when you first make it, people are just dialing you up. I mean, I had this, this agent that was coming after me. It was like, I got all this, this autograph signings lined up for it. And, I'm, and they're just giving me money. I'm just, putting, I'm just smiling, writing my name. And radio stations are interviewing me and all this kind of stuff. And then guess what? Then I go back to Europe, blow out my foot. And, and how many calls did I get after that? It's wild. Maybe that you know. Maybe that's that's what's happened in your life, and and maybe it's just outside circumstance. I mean, I I was I was just returning a kickoff and blew out my foot. Like, you know, it, it was outside of my circum my control. But maybe it was even in your control, and you had this amazing position in life, and for whatever reason. You shot yourself in the foot, and you gave the position away, and now you're going. I wish I could just go back there. And you got deep regret going on in your life right now because the position you once had now is completely taken away. Job verse or 29 verse chapter 29 verse 25 it says this this is what his position was like a chief I told them what to do. Or my Chiefs fans by the way like like Patrick Mahomes I told them what I told them what to do. We have three Chiefs fans. Interesting. This is going to be interesting next week. That's good. I lived like a king. You see that? He lived like a king. He's remembering this. Now in one fell swoop, taken away. I can really relate as a leader. I mean, one day you're the hero, next day you're the goat, depending on how you did. And that's just the price of leadership. I want to speak to leaders in here and, and know when you have your ID and JC only, and your security is in Christ, it's not in position. It is the most immovable position you can be in. Because regardless if you're the CEO or the janitor or anything in between, guess what? My identity is in Christ alone, and I shall not be moved. Brock Purdy, again, I mentioned him. I mean, he was the number one story in the world regarding the NFL. And in one play, a missed block, guess what? The story has ended for right now. And maybe six months until he can actually get on the field. And the question I ask myself is, how is he going to? I, I believe truly that his identity is in Christ so solid that he's going to be just fine. Yeah. In fact, the teammates now, I think that's when your witness really starts. Yeah. All the dudes in the locker room, oh yeah, it must be awesome being Mr. Christian and God's blessing you. But all of a sudden now out of your control, your elbow is snapped and six months now they're going to be looking at, how do you respond now? That's when you build your testimony. And the way you can do it is because your identity is not in your position, what you do. That's what the world squeezes you into this pattern and says, man, you got a position, so you've arrived. You're someone. That's not how we do it as Christians. Our identity is in Christ. He's looking back. <laughs> I can tell you one quick story. It's funny. I might have heard this one before, but part of my career, I ended up in the Arena Football League. So NFL lost my card. I get an AFL card. True story. It's a black card now. It wasn't white. Now it's a black one. <laughs> True story. I'll show it to you sometime. And uh, in year four of that career, if you can call that, I, the title of my position was called Offensive Specialist. For short, it was OS. You're the OS. And your role on the team is to be the featured receiver. You're running around, catching a bunch of balls, touchdowns, and you're top you know, five in the league. You're doing it. And in week 10, our coach gets fired. The defensive coordinator takes the job. His first move is to bench Matt Nagy, my quarterback, and me the very next day. So my role in the team went from like the OS to the HS. What does that mean? I was the holding specialist. The only thing I did on game day, I would sit on the bench. Okay, guys, let's go. 
and then they'd score a touchdown, and then there was like this wall, and I would whoop, jump over the wall. Brought a lot of value to the team. <laughs> but can I be honest with you? That season of my life was such a good training season because God's going, hey, is this all about who, like position? What others think? Can you still be a great teammate and train the young guy that took your job? Can you hold field goals for the glory of God and the betterment of your team? Because I want to test you right now. Because if I can't test you with that, I can't test you with a church. Can't test you with a, trust you with a family. He who is faithful in the little things can be trusted with much. He's testing my heart. Hero to goat. Hero to goat. In the next chapter, verse 1, it says, But now I'm, <laughs> this is Job talking, they all used to praise me because of my position, but now I'm mocked by people younger than I. And those were all my teammates that mocked me. OS is now the HS. Was I going to be moved? He's looking to the past. Past provision, past position. Number three, if you're a note taker, and this is a dicey one, his past prediction, his expectation. Drop down to verse 18. Job 29, verse 18 and we've all been there, haven't we? Look, look what he says. He's, as he's, I thought, surely I will die surrounded by my family after what? After a long, good life. For I'm like a tree whose roots reach the water, whose branches are refreshed by the dew. I thought. I thought. Don't you have a picture of how your life's going to go in your mind? His, he thought, his expectation, his prediction was, man, I'm so solid. I'm so blessed. I'm flourishing in life. Nothing's going to affect me. And I'm just picturing on my deathbed after many years of blessing. And now my kids are going to be around my hospital bed and my spouse, and I'm just going to go to heaven. It's all going to be good. That was his expectation. And we know the story. Tragically, all his kids die in one day. And then his wife, what does his wife say? Hey, curse God and die. Sick, dude. This is great. I mean, complete opposite of the expectation, this prediction that he had for his life. Let me ask you a question. What happens to you and I when our perceived future takes a total twist? Right now, you're 33, 43, 53. I don't know why I kept on getting those numbers. And in your mind, there was a place that you would be maritally there's a place that you would be financially and there's a place that you would have relationship with your kids, your job. In your mind, this is where you thought you would be. And if you're really honest, you feel so let down by God that it's overwhelming and you're tempted to tap and you're going, this is not what I perceived. This is not what I predicted. This is not what I expected. In fact, it's complete opposite of what I expected of where I would be at in life right now. Maybe you're, you're up there in even more years, and in your mind, here was your, here was your perception. I'm going to retire. My spouse and I are going to travel a little bit. We're going to minister to a lot of younger people using all the life experience that we've been through by the power of God and the word of God. And one spouse, for whatever reason, graduates to heaven early, and now you're sitting there by yourself. What now? What do I do? It's a painful new reality. How do I handle it? Job 3, 
and 25, if you remember, after this happens to Job, Job actually says, what I always feared has happened to me. What I dreaded has come true. Think about that. It's like that thing, man. If, if that thing happens, I don't know if I can be okay. I don't know if I can make it. A lot of these other things could probably happen, but if that happens, I don't know if I can e even move forward. And here Job is in chapter 29. He's, he's actually walked through his worst fear, and he's looking back, just wanting to go back. Have you ever just wanted to just, man, I wish this was a bad dream. I wish I could just go back. Anybody in here, right? I wish I wouldn't have made that stupid decision. I wish that wouldn't have happened, and I'm living in the past, and I'm stuck. What do I do? You're like, man, I'm glad I showed up to church today, man, getting this. Hey, can I just tell you, this is just real life. This is real life, and I'm not sure what you're working through right now. I'm just trying to honor God and serve the word of God so we can take real inventory of our relationship with God. Is it based on circumstance or is it based on the Savior? Is it, am I trusting in the sovereignty of God? Or am I like, you know what? If he doesn't serve me the way I want, I'm out. These are completely different pictures of Christianity. I've been reading about Paul. I've been reading his life lately. Can you imagine Paul? <laughs> the dude is trying to reach souls and time and time again, he's thrown in prison. They are stoning him to death. They drag him outside the city, leaving him for dead. Can you imagine Paul's like, this is not what I signed up for. I'm out of here. Or he's like, man, this is brutal. This is terrible. But guess what, God? I'm going to serve you no matter what. I'm going to worship you in good times when I'm in jail or when things are terrible. I'm worshiping you. Bring me back to verse 19 real quick. I want you to see this. Again, he says, I'm like a tree whose roots reach the water, whose branches are refreshed with dew. This interesting picture happened when um, Denise and I, we were gone a little while and she got this brand new plant, speaking of this plant, and we were gone so long that she forgot to have someone water it. She like neglected the darn plant. Good job, D-Money. Um, any event, no. <laughs> and, we, and we get home and she sees this plant and it's, it's like, it was once vibrant and it was like, you know, she was watering it, it was getting sun, it was bling, it was, ah, it was growing. And we get home, this is no lie, and it's like, meh, meh. I mean, it was like yellow, just gnarly. And she, she looked at me, she's like, oh, is there any hope? I think I'm just going to throw it away. But she like, it was like a kid to her. She's like, I can't throw it away. We got to do so. I believe in resurrection power. And she just starts worshiping like, you know, <laughs> this is true. This is true. And, uh. And I started thinking, you know, uh, did they show the picture of it already? They did, yeah. And I was just thinking, I think that's, that's it. And maybe it's not through neglect or our own poor choices, but circumstantially, it is like looking back and going, is there any hope at all? And I believe there's people in here right now, and for whatever reason, you came to this church, and, and here's what, I, man, this is so clear. God spoke to me and he said, you got two choices right now. You can stay stuck, mad at God, bitter, holding on to the past. And you'll look like that plant. Or you can say, I hate it. It's so painful. I can't believe I'm in this, but I'm going to choose to trust you again. I'm going to choose to drink in the word of God. I'm, I'm going to choose to get the nutrients and believe that you can still do something in my life. I came on assignment and God spoke to me so clearly. I'm not like Cap, but maybe the inner Cap is coming in me. And I just want, maybe it's someone online. He said, dare to dream again. There's another phrase. It's okay to be happy again. You might have lost a spouse and you're wondering, would my, this is so awkward. I tell my wife a lot, if for whatever reason I graduate, go marry a really hot Christian guy and like send it downfield and enjoy it. And, and I know that might sound flippant and that's easy to say or whatever, but I'm very honest. Like I want, I want, and I'm, and here's, it's okay to be happy again. 
is okay. And you're like, Todd, you, you, you haven't had anything like this happen to you. You have no platform to preach on this. I agree with you. So guess what? I called my friend Emily again. She's going to close the Bible study. Because you're saying you have no platform, Todd. Your life's been great. You've been blessed. It, it is the Father's faucet of, of favor in your life. Yes. But let me remind you of Emily's story. Emily, in her 20s, newly married, is on a trip with some of our great friends that are pastors from this city, and they're out for a marriage retreat. They're heading on the highway. Some guy hits them and drills a car, kills her husband and spiritual mentors instantly, and she radically, somehow, some way, survives the crash. What do I do? What do I do? So I asked Emily, I said, hey, can you just share with the church? Is it over? Do I stay stuck in the past? Or in spite of the pain, do I move forward to a new reality that I've never, I never would choose, but I'm going to trust God anyways? And so I asked her to, to bring this message to you. Check it out. Hi, love fam. Just wanted to share with you some of the Lord's faithfulness. I remember after the biggest tragedy of my life, contemplating that my obedience to the Lord was going to be pivotal in the direction of the way my life would go. I remember saying to the Lord, you allowed this to happen, and I know that you are the only way that I can get through this. I chose Jesus not because it was easy, but it was the only thing I knew I could do. And let me tell you, friends, He has been so faithful. He's met every need. Every time I cried out to Him, He's given me comfort, and He continues to do so. There's so many blessings and favor that the Lord's given me, but one of the greatest is my husband. I remember after the accident, people trying to set me up on dates, and I explained, you know, I didn't really feel like I was ready, and I said, I don't know if I'll ever get married again, but if I do, I know I will never date anyone who has been divorced, has children, or lives anywhere north because I hate the cult. My first husband's older brother asked me to officiate his wedding in Mexico. And it was there that I met my current husband. He was a groomsman in a wedding. And the funny thing about God is he also has a sense of humor. My husband now, Maverick, he was divorced. He is a father and he lived in Mason City, Iowa, which is consistently 10 degrees colder than Omaha. <laughs> But the Lord confirmed to both of us that we were meant to be together. And we got married, and He's provided so many blessings through this marriage. And He's taught me so much about restoration and how abundant of a God He is. He's allowed us to grow our family, and I'm just so thankful for the blessing that He gave me through my husband and how He brought healing to my heart. I remember days and nights where I was weeping over my kitchen sink because I so desperately wanted to wash another set of dishes. The Lord is so good that I consistently have a sink full of dishes to wash now. I have to be transparent though and also share that even though the Lord has done so much and he has restored so much in my heart and my husband's heart as he's gone through his own trials. Things still aren't always rainbows and sunshine and we still face our struggles through loss and consequences of divorce and shared parenting and our sweet baby girls had a lot of medical challenges. But the thing that we know is that God has been so faithful. 
and he will continue to be faithful. And we know that if we have him as our foundation, that he will see us through and anything. My encouragement to you, wherever you're at today, is that you would know that God is for you. He loves you. Seek him in everything and you will experience his abundance and joy over and over again. So grateful for Mav and Em and it's proof. Here, here they are years down the road and I love how she was transparent. It hasn't been easy, but it was a choice. So let's stand together because I'm not quite sure